Hello, I'm Kirk Weiler, and this is Common Core Algebra 2 by eMath Instruction. Today, we're going to be doing Unit 6, Lesson Number 6 on the Zero Product Law. Now, um, if you watched any of my videos from Common Core Algebra 1, all right, for me, the Zero Product Law is one of, if not the most powerful equation-solving techniques of all time. Um, it allows us to expand our ability to solve equations algebraically from simple linear equations to much more complicated ones. All right. It gets used in virtually all math courses, and so it's a really important law to not only understand the mechanics of, but also to understand why it works. So let's jump right into it. The zero product law. Know everything about this law, including its name. Why? Because the zero product law states that if the product of multiple factors is equal to zero, then at least one of those factors must be equal to zero. Now I want you to think about this. If I told you that two numbers, a and b, let's say, had a product of 12, well, one of them doesn't have to be 12, right? a could be 3, b could be 4. If I told you that the product of two numbers was equal to 1, you know, as long as you're comfortable with fractions, no problem. Then I could have three times one third, right? You wouldn't have to be, you wouldn't have to have one of them be equal to one. On the other hand, if a times b is equal to zero, then either a must be equal to zero or b must be equal to zero. There's no way to take two non-zero numbers, form their product, and get zero. And this is an amazing thing about both products and the number zero, and it doesn't work with anything else. And yet I'll still have students at very high levels try to apply the zero product law to products that aren't equal to zero or things equaling to zero that aren't products. All right? So that's why I'm a big believer in really knowing the name of this law, the zero product law. Okay. I'm going to clear this out, and then let's do some zero product law work. I know that this is very much a review, all right? But stick with me. Let's go through it. Exercise number one, solve each of the following equations for all values of x. Well, look, I don't want to look at this and go, oh, i got to multiply these things out. Nah. I've got a product equal to zero. So either x plus 7 is equal to zero, or x minus 3 must be equal to 0. One of those two has to be equal to 0. So I subtract a 7 in both cases, and x equals negative 7. In this case, I add a 3 in both cases, and x equals 3. So these two values of x solve that equation. Not too tough. Why don't you do letter B? Okay, let's work through it. Well, again, not very hard, there's a fraction involved, but I think we can live with that. Either 2x minus 5 equals 0, right? Or x minus 4 is equal to 0. Add 5 to both sides. We'll probably start speeding this up. 2x equals 5, divide both sides by 2. And x is equal to 5 halves, or any other way you want to put it, 2 and 1 half, 2.5, etc. Here, much easier, plus 4 plus 4. Now, some students, unfortunately, get into a bad habit. And they say, I'm going to look in the parentheses. I'm going to look at this number, and then I'm going to just do the opposite, right? So here I see a negative 4, so I have a positive 4. Here I see a negative 3, I get a positive 3. Here I got a positive 7, here I got a negative 7. Now, that's not a bad pattern, okay? And it's going to help us later on. But obviously it didn't work with the 2x minus 5 because we didn't get an answer of 5. We got an answer of 5 halves. Okay, So you have to watch out for that. Now let's look at the last one. This is the kind of thing that might show up if you had to do some complete factoring of some type. Here I have the product of three things. All right, um, I've got 4 equals 0, or 3x plus 2 is equal to 0, or 4x minus 3 is equal to 0. Well, there's no solutions to this. Here, I would get x equals negative 2 thirds. And here, I would get x equals positive 3 fourths. And I would, strangely enough, encourage you to work on those in your head. 
You know, when you do the zero product law, almost always, the worst case scenario is you'll be faced with a two-step linear equation. And it'll always be the same two steps. You either add or subtract, and then you tend to either multiply or divide. So it's pretty easy to do these in your head. Now I kind of brushed something over really quickly, but taking a look at exercise two, it says in exercise 1c, why does the factor of 4 have no effect on the solution set of the equation? Because the solution set of the equation is negative 2 thirds and 3 fourths. Those are the solutions to this equation. And the 4 had nothing to do with it. So why did the 4 have no effect? Any thoughts? All right, so 4 has no effect because it cannot be equal to zero, right? The zero product law doesn't say that all the things have to be equal to zero. It means it says at least one of them does, right? And because we can exploit that, we can find all values of x that do make the expression equal to zero. But if we have some kind of numerical GCF sitting out there, well, that's not zero, can't be zero, so it has no effect on the solution set. All right, pause the video now, write down anything you have to before we move on to some that are slightly more challenging. Okay, let's get rid of the text. Now, exercise three, these are the more full-blown versions of the zero product law. All right, we've got typically some kind of a quadratic equation that we're trying to solve. There's no way to just do that using inverses. But in order to use the zero product law, two things have to be true. We have to have an equation equal to zero, and we have to have the non-zero portion of it written in factored form. So the first thing I notice in this equation is it's simply not equal to zero. So I have to get one side equal to zero, and I'm going to do that all in one step by adding a 2x and subtracting a 10, all in one step. That's going to give me x squared plus 5x, watch out here, minus 24 is equal to 0. So this is really important. That's the 0 in the 0 product law. But we still don't have the product part. To have the product part, we need to factor, right? And this is just a trinomial. I always have this just list of factoring in my head. Okay, is there a GCF? No. Uh, is it difference of perfect squares? No. Is it trinomial? Yes. Is it factoring by grouping? Yes. You know, whatever. In this case, it's a trinomial. So I guess and check. This is a pretty easy trinomial to guess and check. X and X. Um, I think we've got an 8 and a 3. That'll get us a 24. And if it's a positive 8 and a negative 3, that'll give me my positive 5. Now we have the zero product law. We're literally at the point we were at in exercise one. We can now say x plus 8 equals zero and x equals negative 8. And we can say x minus 3 equals zero and x is 3. All right, simple enough. Letter B is a little bit more challenging. What I'd like you to do is pause the video now and see how much you understand about this. Okay, let's go through it. Again, it's not equal to zero yet, so I'm going to get this side equal to zero. Subtract an x squared from both sides. Subtract a 3x and add a 2. Ooh, lots going on there. 3x squared minus x squared is 2x squared. 12x minus 3x is positive 9x. And negative 7 plus 2 is negative 5 equals zero. All right, well, we certainly have it equal to zero now. We now have to factor. Again, this is some basic trinomial factoring. There's no GCF. There's no way it's factoring by grouping or the difference of perfect squares. I know that's going to be an x and an x. Let's see, I think this is right. Let me check. 10x minus x is 9x. Great. Now we have a product equal to zero. So we can take 2x minus 1, set it equal to zero, and we'll get x equals 1 half. And we can take x plus 5, set it equal to 0, and we get x equals negative 5. And that's it. Right, so the zero product law requires us to have the equation equal to 0 and to have it written in product form. 
If either one of those two isn't the case, the zero product law cannot be used. All right, pause the video and take a moment to write down anything you need to. Okay, I'm going to clear out the text. <clears throat> then we'll go on and do a little bit of uh, applied or applications of the zero product law. Okay, one of the places that we use, tend to use the zero product law a lot, and one place that you used it in common core geometry, was solving a linear quadratic system. In other words, a system that consists of a parabola and a line. And letter A says, find the intersection points of these curves algebraically. Well, see if you remember how to do this. Pause the video. Remember, you're doing this algebraically. We'll use the graphing calculator in a moment. All right. Well, all this means is that we're solving a system of equations. Um, and we're going to do that by substitution. I'm going to put this in here. No, no three equations and three unknowns, so I don't have to do it by elimination. But I'm going to set this equal to this. Oftentimes math teachers will say, ah, we're solving a system algebraically, let's set the equations equal. And that's fine if they're both functions. Now again, zero product law forces us to get this equal to zero. So I'm going to subtract a 4x and subtract a 5. And that's going to give me 3x squared minus 12x. Oh, those cancel. All right. Now I have to factor this, and I have to be careful, because this is simply GCF factoring. We can pull a 3x out of both of those. Here I'd be left with x minus 4. Now again, be careful. Don't do anything weird. Set this equal to 0. Set this equal to 0. Again, stay steady. We'll have x equals 0. and x equals 4. Now, of course, those are the x-coordinates of intersection. They aren't the y-coordinates. We need to substitute those into one of those two equations. And of course, if we substitute into both of them, that's a great check to see if we're right. We just need to substitute them into one of those two equations. Um, so I'm going to choose the easier one. For x equals 0, I'm going to put it in here. y equals 4 times 0 plus 5. And that gives me 5. So one point is 0, 5 box in it. Now let's go with x equals 4. y equals 4 times 4 plus 5. 16 plus 5 is 21. So we'll have the point 4 comma 21. Now if I did everything correct, then I can graph this in my calculator, use the intersect command, and those are the two points I will also see. All right? So what I'd like you to do right now is pause the video, take out your TI-84+, try to put these two equations in, play around with the graphing window, see if you can remember how to use the intersect command, um, etc., etc., and then we'll go through it all. But pause the video now and take up to 10 minutes to really explore this on your graphing calculator. All right, let's do it. Let's bring out that TI-84+. plus. Oh, that wasn't very loud, but still, the calculator knew. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to put both of these equations in. So let's go into y equals. All right, if you have any equations in there, go ahead and clear them on out. Now, hopefully you've already played around with this, but I'm going to walk kind of through it slowly anyway. So in y1, I'm going to put in 3x squared minus 8x plus 5, enter. And for y2, I'm going to put in 4x plus 5, and I'm going to hit enter. Now, maybe the most challenging thing here is making sure you get a good window so that you find both intersection points. And very often, lines and parabolas have two intersection points. They don't have to. They could have one intersection point or none at all if they just literally miss each other, like, like this makes any sense, sorry. Um, so let's, let's, let's take a look at the window. Um, now again, I played around with this quite a bit, so I have a good window. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in an x min of negative 5, and I'm going to put in an x max of positive 5. Then I'm going to put in a y min of negative 5, 
and I used a y max of 25. Now that's not a bad idea given the fact that I, I know one of the intersection points is at 4 comma 21, or at least I think it is. So I've now got my window set up. I've even labeled all my axes. Let's hit the graph button. Takes a little while for both curves to be graphed. All right. But I think I'll probably try to mimic the colors they have, so let's do it. Um, not going to get it perfect, but that's okay. The parabola looks something like this, just I think just barely dips below the x-axis. Boy, that was that was just terrible. Um, and that's y equals 3x squared minus 8x plus 5. Remember to always label your equations when you solve anything where you've got more than one graphed. There's my line. Let me label it y equals 4x plus 5. All right, there they are. Now we can see the intersection points. They're right here and right here. Sorry, I know that's a little bit more up on the screen. And let's just go through the intersect command just once to find the larger one or the one more to the right. All right, let's take a look at how we do that. All right, so we're going to go into the calculate menu. All right, and we're going to go down to the intersect. Okay, great, we got it. Let's hit enter on that. And now it asks for our first curve, so we'll hit enter. Our second curve, we'll hit enter. I guess we just got to make sure our cursor is closer to the one we're looking for than the other one, so we move that over. All right, I think we're ready now. We're going to hit enter, and look at that. It comes up with the point 4, 21. Okay, so looks like our work is right. I mean, I could have checked the 0, 5, but I'm pretty sure that's right just based on the look of the graph. All right, pause the video now and write down anything you need to, and then we're going to move on. Okay, here we go. All right, exercise five. The parabola shown at the right has the equation y equals x squared minus 2x minus 3. Letter A. Write the coordinates of the two x-intercepts of the graph. That's not very difficult. Uh, here's one, and that's at x equals negative 1. And here's the other one, that's at x equals positive 3. Yay! Letter B says, find the x-intercepts of the parabola algebraically. Well, what is always true about the x-intercepts? The output, y equals 0, which is why we oftentimes call x-intercepts zeros, because the y value is 0 there. Now, in order to find them algebraically, what that means is that I will always just substitute in 0 for y. Regardless of whether they're asking me to find the x-intercepts or the zeros, I'm going to do the same thing. But, thankfully, that's then set up perfectly for the zero product law. Right, I find x minus 3 times x plus 1, and then, of course, that x minus 3 equaling 0, x is equal to 3, x plus 1 is equal to 0, and x is negative 1. So we verified. All right. Finding the zeros or the x-intercepts of any function is important, but parabolas give us a good example of where we can often use the zero product law. All right. Well, pause the video, copy this down, and then we'll do a few more of these and wrap up the lesson. Okay. Now, of course, once you understand what's going on here, it's not that hard. It says, algebraically find the set of x-intercepts for each parabola given below. So for each one of them, what you're going to be doing is simply setting y equal to 0, right, and then solving the resulting equation. So this is all about the zero product law. Why don't you pause the video now and give, give each one of those three a really good attempt. Each one of them involves a different type of factoring. So go for it. All right, let's go through it. Simple enough, 0 equals 4x squared minus 1. We've got it equal to 0, but how do we factor it? Well, we can factor this as 2x plus 1 times 2x minus 1, in which case we've got 2x plus 1 equals 0, and that gives me x equals negative 1 half. And we've got 2x minus 1 equals 0, which equals x equals positive 1 half. 
Yeah, that's simple enough. Letter B. Ooh, this is going to be a little bit uglier, I think. Nice little trinomial. All right, we've got to guess and check that. Thankfully, the 3 is prime, otherwise this would have been horrible. 3x and x. Now I got a negative 10, so that's most likely a 5 and a 2. Something like that. In which case, I'll have 3x minus 2 equals 0, and x equals 2 thirds and x plus 5 equals 0, and x equals negative 5. All right, last one. 5x squared minus 10x is equal to 0. I can pull a 5x out of both of those. All right. And now I'll set 5x equal to 0. Remember, don't take any gimmicks, no shortcuts here. Whoops, <laughs> I almost said 0 divided by 5 was 5. That would have been a bit embarrassing. And then x minus 2 equals 0, and x equals 2. Might as well go back and retroactively circle all the answers, just so you see them. All right, well, that's the zero product law. Pause the video now and write down anything you need to. Okay, let's clear out the text and finish up this lesson. So today we looked at the zero product law. Now again, it doesn't work for every equation, but for those equations that you can set equal to zero, which that, that pretty much is true for all equations, um, for equations that you can set equal to zero and then factor the non-zero side of the equation, the zero product law is amazing. Now don't get me wrong, it often takes a, an, one equation with an x squared in it and creates two equations with x to the first. But still, I'll take that trade-off, because ultimately, it's going to allow me to solve quadratics and higher-order equations. All right, well, enough of that for now. I'd like to thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.